What up, HyperChange? Today we're going Plaid Plus with a review of Tesla's Q4 2020 earnings. I just got off the conference call, heard from Elon Musk, Zach Kirkhorn, the management team about the quarter. We got a new shareholder letter to unpack, a ton of epic news, including the refresh of the Model S, which was extremely highly anticipated, and the Model X, new interior, uh, Plaid, this so much anticipation. Uh, I almost lost it when I saw these pictures uh, because it was even better than I could have imagined. I think has a lot of clues to the future of Tesla's product road maps. We're going to unpack all of that today. Um, let's just start out with the financials headline number here. Revenue on 181,000 deliveries came in at 10.744 billion, a 46% increase year over year and a all-time record for the company. Um, this came despite the fact that average selling prices of their vehicles declined 11%. And in the face of this, they were still able to achieve 46% revenue growth and cross that $10 billion uh, milestone. Gross profit for the quarter was 2.066 billion, up 49% year over year slightly disappointing in terms of gross margin numbers coming in at 19.2% on a gap basis for the overall company. This was the lowest in all of 2020, but still um, better than the 18.8% that was reported in Q4 2019. Um, in terms of income from operations, we did see an increase in operating expenses. So uh, partially due to Elon Musk's stock comp, as well as a bunch of other things um, that were sort of one time in nature, which we can get into more. Um, but that led to operating income being a little bit disappointing. Uh, only 575 million. This was up 60% um, from Q4 2019, but down sequentially from Q3 2020, but not a big deal at all. Last quarter, Tesla does better than we're expecting profits. This quarter, they do worse. We'll see what happens next. But um, even out and the trajectory in the long term here is still extremely positive for Tesla posting its sixth profitable quarter in a, in a row, and 2020 is its first full profitable year ever as a company. So this is truly an inflection point where Tesla now is consistent and sustainably profitable like they've been promising. Additionally, cash flow was incredibly strong in the quarter, a record of operating cash flow of $3 billion, up 112% year over year, um, up $600 million sequentially. Capital expenditures were a record of $1.15 billion, an increase of 179% as the company builds three factories around the world simultaneously. Despite all of that, expenses for future growth, free cash flow came in at $1.9 billion, up 84%, um, an all-time record for free, free cash flow. So now Tesla's free cash flow, almost an $8 billion annual run rate based on this quarter, extremely profitable. They ended with $20 billion of cash in the bank, an all-time high for the company, rock solid balance sheet going forward. So this was an absolutely epic quarter uh, for Tesla financially, a little bit disappointing in the gross margin and profitability, but I think we're gonna get a bump back of that next time. And the top line was extremely extremely strong. But more importantly than that, were a few really exciting business updates that we got in the shareholder letter. I'm just going to start with what I'm most excited about, which has got to be the Plaid Model S. This is perhaps the biggest change um, to Tesla's vehicle lineup that we've seen in years since the introduction of the Model Y, maybe. Uh, the Model S launched in 2012, hadn't really had an update since then. And now um, I tweeted at Elon Musk asking him if they were going to do the horizontal touchscreen, um, asking if they were going to do a Steez exterior refresh. He replies with the winky face. Um, and it appears that that was all basically true. The rumors were true. Not only are they doing this revolutionary overhaul of the Model S, but it's also coming much earlier than anticipated with deliveries of the Plaid starting in February. Um, unclear if that's Plaid Plus or not, but that will include this interior. So this interior is totally different. It is built for full self-driving and for an autonomous or increasingly autonomous world. As you can see, we're looking at gaming being front and center there. The Witcher, um, Tesla's big new focus on gaming, and this car actually comes with a gaming computer with 10 teraflops of processing power. Um, I don't even know what that means, but Tesla's focus on in-car entertainment is apparent here. There was just no way with that vertical screen you were going to want to watch a movie. But now with this incredible, beautiful center console, um, I just think this was so overdue. And now the Model S finally feels like the coolest, newest, latest and greatest Tesla. Um, I just, I was blown away and still am blown away in processing uh, this refresh. Additionally, we got the front screen there. You can see that little red Model S and on top, uh, <laughs> that's sitting right on top of that epic steering wheel, um, which is already getting some criticism in the Reddit community. And some people were like, oh, it's not going to be as fun to drive. It's not going to be able to turn. Is it even legal? Who knows? I think it looks incredibly dope. And there's a couple changes without the stocks. Um, looks like those have been removed. Um, so just Tesla here looks like they're showing us the future. We've got some really nice wood accents and detailing. Um, I am just such a big fan of this refresh and the screen in the back seats as well, really going for a much more lavish interior experience, which some people say has been lacking for the Tesla brand. It appears they address all of these concerns um, with this refresh. In terms of the exterior, we're not looking at too many different changes here. Um, the car, I mean, I think it looks a little more aggressive. The front is a little bit different with some more uh, similar vents to, I guess, the Model 3 and Y. Um, but honestly, the exterior changes were not as profound as the interior changes. 
So Tesla's updated their uh, configurator on their website as well. And interestingly, it has bifurcated the Plaid Model S into two different tri-motor all-wheel drive variants. We have the normal Plaid starting at $119,990. And then we have the Plaid Plus version with $139,000 or $140,000 essentially. The difference in performance here is mostly in range, 390 miles um, for the normal Plaid. And then for the Plaid Plus, we're getting 520 miles of range. And the game changer here is that zero to 60 time, which is going to be under two seconds. No car in the history of the planet that is a legal production streetcar has ever gone zero to 60 in under two seconds. So this is a huge milestone uh, for Tesla and the team. And to accomplish it with a four-door sedan, that's not even a sports car, pretty insane. I do think it is interesting to note that this is significantly higher priced than the Model S, which was long range, originally starting at 70 grand before this update. Um, and to make sure that people who bought the old Model S aren't feeling as bad, the cheapest Model S is now $80,000. Now, Model X, you might be wondering what happened happen with that. I was even thinking they might even discontinue the Model X. Totally not what happened. They've ended up introducing a Plaid variant, but not a Plaid Plus variant, adding to the confusion of what's really going on under the hood here. Um, but the new Model X is starting at $89,000 or basically $90,000 with the Plaid variant starting at $120,000 for with 340 miles of range. So a little bit less range they're expected, but that performance is really what you're paying for with a 0-60 to 60 time of 2.5 seconds. So interestingly enough, on the conference call. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but Elon said that these cars would be using the 18650 cells from Panasonic, not the 4680 cells. But my question is, will we be using the 4680 cells for that Plaid Plus variant? And is that the unlock for more range? Unclear. But what is super duper exciting is Tesla has refreshed this Model S and X line. We know that Model S and X sales had sort of been in decline since 2017 or 2018 as the Model 3 and Y had come out and gotten some new of that newer technology. Tesla's brought all of that to the S and X and truly done what is I guess we're, the closest thing we're going to get to Tesla ever doing a refresh. And so this is just super duper exciting. And I think it'll have a huge impact on Model S sales. But honestly, I'm more just kind of fanboying out about it because as a Tesla fanboy who loves their products, seeing something that's so new, radical, and futuristic, every single influencer is tweeting about it. The amount of headlines, press, and marketing that this car is getting uh, and attention for Tesla is absolutely epic. Another big thing, factory progress. Tesla making huge progress in Berlin. They showed us some really amazing pictures of not only the exterior looking pretty complete, Complete, but also the interior. This is expected uh, to be a, begin delivering vehicles by the end of this year with our new in-house battery cells. So that's some very interesting, still guiding that those 4680s are set to hit the road this year coming out of Berlin. And Austin um, is on track to start vehicle production this year, although it is important to note that on the conference call, Elon was like, we might deliver a handful of Cybertrucks this year, um, but not many. So maybe that indicates that Model Y will be the first vehicle that will be built in Tesla Austin. Diving a little bit deeper on this capacity, you can see that Tesla's updated their install capacity slide to have a capacity now of 1.05 million vehicles, 450,000 of those Model 3 and Y coming from Shanghai, which is unbelievable that has gotten off the ground so quickly, almost hitting the levels of Fremont production. Fremont at 500,000 a year, Model 3 and Y plus 100,000 SNX. So total, that's over a million units of installed production capacity for Tesla. They mentioned that the Model 3 is at a rate of 5,000 units per week production or 250,000 units a year sustainably. Uh, which is pretty incredible. The Model Y ramp in Shanghai just started at the end of 2020. Looks like that's going to be ramping strongly uh, throughout the entire year as well. So another huge year of growth expected from Tesla China. Actually, you know, almost single-handedly doing all of the growth for Tesla, at least from their delivery guidance, because Tesla only guided uh, for 50% unit growth uh, for the year. I think this is a, a little reason people were let down or confused. I actually thought this was really smart guidance, basically being conservative, um, not trying to overpromise. Um, but tr are trying to underpromise and overdeliver, which I think is totally the right move. 50% growth for a vehicle comp vehicle company is still insane. I still think they're going to do closer to 80% growth this year, maybe even a little more. On the conference call, Elon did reiterate that although 50% is their goal, he thinks they can be meaningfully above that both this year and next. So incredible growth uh, lining up ahead for Tesla. In terms of Tesla energy, this was an absolute breakout quarter. We had solar energy uh, deployments up 59% to 86 megawatts um, in the quarter. This was a record since almost 2018. So a huge bounce back um, in the company's solar uh, division. And they talked a little bit more about that on the conference call. And then the storage division as well, having an even better quarter, almost doubling sequentially and up 200% year over year to 1,584 megawatt hours installed. So just an absolutely gangbuster quarter for Tesla energy. Um, they hit almost a $3 billion revenue 
revenue run rate to exit the year and over 2 billion revenue for the entire year. So this was truly um, a breakout quarter for Tesla Energy. For the quarter, the energy revenue came in at 752 million, up huge from the 436 million in Q4 last year and from the record 579 million of last quarter. It looks like it's not gonna be long before Tesla's energy business hits a billion revenue run rate. It seems like we're just getting started um, for that piece. All right, moving on to the conference call. Elon Musk giving the intro per usual, recapping an epic year for Tesla, saying they hit the milestone of 500,000 cars produced and delivered, almost as many as in the company's entire history that were just accomplished in 2020. And then he does a huge uh, thank you and shout out to the team, which I absolutely love. I'm such a fan of the way Elon always puts the team first, always gives them a shout out in every conference call. Um, just a really kind of selfless move and just an awesome thing to see the CEO have that humility, give the shout out and cred um, to and realize it's not just him. It's really the whole team of Tesla that makes this possible. So I love how I, it's just one kind of detail, but that I always notice um, that Elon goes out of his way to do. Additionally, he says we're really focused on capacity expansion, Model Y at Fremont almost at full speed, heat pump got integrated into all vehicles. Um, we got a single piece Model Y casting into production, the largest and most advanced casting machine ever until they one up that with the Cybertruck in Texas. Reiterates that Berlin and Austin are on track to begin production this year. And he says they built a battery factory in the Bay Area, the pilot plant, which he already thinks is in one of the top 10 largest battery facilities in the world, despite just being a pilot plant. So massive improvements and growth made in 2020 and profitability. Um, he also says the new Model S and X Plaid, way ahead of schedule. The first Model S will be delivered in February, just about a month from now. Um, the first Plaid deliveries will be starting. Uh, Mob Model X Plaid deliveries will start a little bit later, maybe around April. Um, and he also keeps mentioning that there'll be another call in like a week or in a couple of days about the new Plaid Model S. So it sounds like we're going to get a bigger press sort of event or, or information from Elon about that product launch. He kind of goes on a tangent about how it's so insane that the Model S is faster. It's like the fastest car on the road, even though it's a sedan and that he thinks it's the best car of of any kind available for any price in the world right now. Um, I think you got to, once you see the touch, the touch screen, the tech, um, the speed, the performance, the range, the sexiness of the car, I think and the, the, the ability to see as many people as it does. Honestly, I kind of feel it. Uh, the FOMO is real. This is an incredible product. I think demand is going to be overwhelm Tesla. This is probably going to be something that they're, you know, supply constrained on for quarters. It's going to take them a while to fill the backlog of people that want this Plaid X. Like I was saying, like the amount of tweets I've seen of people who want this car um, is unbelievable. Then he goes on to FSD, uh, mentioning there's about a thousand people in the beta. Each release, they're improving it, improving it rapidly with these iterative releases. Um, he says he drives the latest build. You've got to love Elon, always on the front lines of his own products and software. Um, and he's saying it's very common and have no interventions at all, um, even that to places he's never been to. So he's testing the software, the amount of interventions decreasing. He's highly confident the car can drive better than a human this year. So that's not good enough for regulators to approve a robo-taxi service, but that is statistically better than a human, the average driver. Maybe so you think you're a good driver, maybe you still can be autopilot. I don't know. Anyway, uh, then he talks about how to justify the value of the company where it is today, which is really interesting and honestly echoes a lot of the things we talk about here on Hyperchain. It's like, okay, Tesla's selling car business, maybe can't justify this, but if you factor in the software layer of autonomy, then this could be a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. So a 30, you know, we're pricing like a 33% chance of that happening. I don't know. It seems kind of fair. So the way Elon breaks this down is, okay, next year, we're going to sell about 50 to 60 billion worth of cars. If they become FSD, that's a 5X utility increase calculated by having 12 usable hours a week up to 60 usable hours a week, 5X increase. But He's like, that's way too dope. Let's only assume a 2x utility increase um, in the amount of hours driven when FSD hits. That's a doubling of the revenue of the company, almost entirely gross margin, almost overnight, 50 billion worth of cars with 50 billion worth of incremental software. And then that's 50 billion worth of incremental profit. 20 PE on that is $1 trillion. And we're still in high growth mode. So Elon almost justifying the trillion dollar market cap on the call, pretty insane. Um, so he's basically saying, and that's just with FSD and cars, not including energy, not including auto bidder, all this other crazy stuff we're up to. Um, and that could still get us to a trillion dollars. So fascinating to hear Elon even think that the valuation is rational and kind of echo the sentiments of a lot of the bulls in the community. Um, additionally, he even says a lot of investors have taken this approach to valuing us with this FSD optionality. So I don't know. I just think this is a once in a lifetime sort of business case study here where Wall Street, no one has ever seen a company like this where the flipping on a switch, the biggest asset price change in history when all these million plus cars are enabled for FSD. I mean, the amount of profit is just hard to fathom. Will that happen? It's not a sure thing. How do you price in that trillion dollar option? I mean, it's just um, we're in kind of unknown territory here, but I think that makes the, be the best sense and is the best way to understand it. Anyway, he says, wrapping it up, 2020 was the turning point for profitability for Tesla. This is just the beginning. 21, 21, 2021 will be even more exciting. Um, 
unless something crazy external happens, making a joke about 2020, because of course, you never know, pandemic. I mean, we've all learned that this year. Um, and then the most excited for new factories equal less car on boats equals less capital tied up. This is a supremely underrated um, thing that's happening in Tesla's business right now that people don't realize is as they build these factories and do local deliveries and increase the percentage of local deliveries, that's a huge uh, de-straining of the cash flow situation for Tesla. It actually means they can get paid for their cars before they have to pay suppliers. Um, not that they are in you know, stretch for cash now, but that does really help a lot of different subtle aspects of how the company works and just makes them have more optionality with their capital. Um, so Zach Kirkhorn, the CFO, comes on, calls 2020 an extremely successful year despite challenges, says they have $1.9 billion in free cash flow, reducing the use of debt, working capital, paid off a convertible debt of $2 billion in Q4, first calendar year and six quarters of profits in a row, gross margins up for the year despite ASP declining. Q4 was noisy. He's never said that before. So I would really look into that is that Zach Kirkhorn's basically saying, okay, don't look too much at the OPEX and gross margin this quarter. There was a lot of weird wonky one-time stuff. Um, some of the things he mentions is that auto gross margin was impacted by product improvement in Fremont, the new model S and X, a single piece casting for model Y, putting the new heat pump in the model three, the pandemic inefficiencies, adjusting for all of those. We actually saw in our internal metrics, he says, an improvement in automotive gross margin. So that is a fascinating clue. And I actually believe that when Tesla says that, and they usually have one of these off quarters for gross margin next quarter, or maybe Q1 always hurting, but in Q2, Q3, we're going to see that gross margin trajectory of heading towards 30% resume. Additionally, energy gross margin says was impacted by solar, uh, uh, the seasonality of the lease and PPA business, as well as the solar roof being, I guess, lower gross margin than most of their other energy revenue. And overall, though, operating expenses, percentage of revenue continues to decrease. They also had that early some settlement of the convertible note added an extra $100 million of interest expense. So that's another thing that hit this quarter. Kirkhorn goes on to reiterate, though, that in the long term, although there was a slight dip in operating margin this quarter, they continue uh, to want to grow operating margin. That means they're not just going to grow, you know, profitability or along with revenue, but actually faster than revenue and remain industry leading in that. And so he thinks there's a wide range of outcomes this year, given the amount of product launches. And he also indicates that Q1 will have the benefit of an early model wire up in Shanghai, but SNX units will be low due to transition to the new Plaid products. So lots of stuff in Q1, but I think things get way, way better from there. He also mentions the semiconductor and shipping shortages due to the pandemic. So unclear how that's actually playing into the income statement, but interesting he noted that. He ends it by saying that global demand continues to outpace production. Then we move into the Q&A. Um, what's Tesla holding? What's holding Tesla back? Being the leader in solar, um, basically Elon's like, look, our quarter was fire, the best since 2018. We're already bouncing back. We had two years where we had to devote the entire company to Model Three. Then we had to reshift back to solar. The focus is there. We're going to be the leader. Kirkhorn jumps in with a really interesting comment about how the cost structure needs to be industry leading before the price can be industry leading. They've had to do a lot of moves to make the cost structure of FSD better and more appealing, and then are passing on those savings to consumers. And they think in this year. There's going to be a key breakthrough. Additionally, the integration of Powerwall with the solar products, both retrofit and solar roof, needs to get a lot better. And that's going to be something they're going to take care of this year as well. FSD transfer this is something I just debated with Raj on his channel. They said they're not looking into it yet, and they're going to launch the subscription service in the next month or two. So fascinating um, to see that news drop and what will happen then. A question about the progress on the dry coating of the battery electrode. Is this still holding back the potential to ramp this product? Um, Drew comes in and basically says, honestly, everything, we're solving each challenge to date. The 4680 design is working. We're meeting targets. We're on track for a full production ramp this year. We're still going for a 100 gigawatt hour in 2022 goal. Basically saying everything is on track. Next question is about FSD. How confident or why are you so confident that we will achieve level five in 2021? Why no dojo needed? Elon says we're confident and, and based on his understanding of the tech roadmap and progress between each iteration, now it's not remarkable for the car to drive you without interventions. It needs to get better than a human by a factor of 100% or 200%. Um, but he says it's happening so rapidly. We've got so much training data with so many cars in the field and we're moving everything towards video labeling. Apparently this is a really big um, piece of the equation. There's a few pieces of the neural net that need to be upgraded to video training. Each They're sort of upgrading a couple stragglers left, but once that's complete, it's going to be a big addition. It's all about making this labeling process better, um, appears to be the biggest friction or the limiting factor on that FSD development. Um, and this dojo training that super training the supercomputer, maybe the best neural net training computer in the world by an order of magnitude, says Elon, and they need to get the FSD system 2,000% better than a human, not just 200%. That's where dojo is really going to come in and make this, you know, that true robo-taxi level um, of autonomy reliability. They got asked about the current run rate of 4680 cell production. I thought this was a great question, someone I wanted to ask, but they 
said they're, they didn't really give any details. They basically said we're still on track, 100 gigawatt hours of total cell produced in 2022, which is would be mind blowing if they're anywhere near that. But he's basically saying um, it's going to happen exponentially. Who knows when we'll hit that number, the famous S curve line by Tesla management, um, but that they are still ramping like crazy. I mean, they just released that video that is so dope showing the battery cell production. Um, and they're basically saying we're installing all that capacity to make the moves needed to hit that 100 gigawatt hour in 2022. Um, they ask about service. Um, I, Jerome comes in with some really good answers about how they're really trying to improve it. And the best service is no service. Um, the frequency of service visits decreased by a third. 50% um, of service visits last less than two hours. There's 140 service centers in North America. In a hundred of those, you can get an appointment in less than 10 days. So he's going to make sure all service centers are at that point soon. So I love the focus and really, and I even wrote this note here that's like, these guys sounded professional AF, like when they were talking about that, this. And I really think they almost feel like they have an executive coach or something because because such a professional, mature, mature tone and answer from Jerome and oh, honestly, the whole team, I was really impressed. Um, but they say the focus for service is really on the app, not just phone calls. It's a way more efficient way to handle inbound customer requests. I love that automation. Institutional question about FSD development. Elon says the eight camera thing um, and having eight cameras do surround video is huge. We used to have a single camera with a single frame, not combining camera feeds with the AI. Now they're combining all of that with a new dimension called time. And now they're just making the one step at a time progress to get FSD done with the betas, slowly expanding it. Um, I was really excited to hear that. And from Elon's standpoint, there's a clear and obvious path. The vehicle will drive 100% safer than a person in the pretty near term, I guess, by this year. And he doesn't see any obstacles. Here's an excellent question about licensing FSD or auto bidder to other OEMs. Something we've talked about a lot on the channel. And Elon says we're very open to it. Um, we've already had preliminary discussions about licensing autopilot to other OEMs. We need to do more work to prove FSD um, until those can really progress. Obviously, you're not going to buy the autopilot software if, or FSD software if you can't have a government approved FSD. Um, but the same goes for auto bidder. We haven't thought about it as much because it's a little bit newer, but we also are willing to license that out. So very interesting uh, point here. And he kind of hones in on like a jab to Apple saying we're not a walled garden. We want to let other companies use our software and our superchargers. TBD for the first official partnership there. Uh, but that is really interesting to say Elon is really willing to, to open it up. FSD strategy for China versus the rest of the world. Elon says the FSD attachment rate in China is just one to 2%. This was totally fascinating and blew me away. I was not expecting it to be that low. Um, I believe it's like 25% here in the US. So way lower. And he says that our customers in China are extremely discerning, but we want to have a big break for FSD or will be a big break for FSD if we can get some real progress there in China. Um, so hopefully later this year, I still think there's a huge opportunity to partner with the government of China to help build some like autopilot only or FSD only uh, lanes on the highway. Um, I think I don't know. I think there'll be a huge opportunity um, for Tesla to work with the government to really bring a truly autonomous vehicle and technology to market. So I'm really curious. I don't know. I've always thought that could be easy, but apparently China's actually lagging in terms of FSD adoption. Then they have a question about is the real best way to gauge earnings power the basically ability for you to uh, build batteries and then how much value you can get from those batteries? And Elon's like, yes. And the reason we're doing our own cell production, he kind of goes on a rant here, is to accelerate our growth. We do not want to stop using cells from other suppliers. We want to buy as many cells as we can from all those suppliers. He knows the suppliers listening to the conference call when he says this. Um, it's basically like, we want you to increase production. We're going to keep buying all of your cells. The only reason we are increasing our or starting to build our own cells is because we literally need more cells. So Elon, is like continually what he's been doing for eight quarters in a row or even more just pounding the table saying we need more batteries um cell put output dictates vehicle output and um then double or more that for autonomy revenue and that's how you figure out the value of the company long term is this interesting tidbit elon throws basically like okay we can produce cars for a million cars batteries for a million cars a um, million cars times 50 grand a car times another 50 grand in software revenue. That's kind of the core earnings power based on our current run rate. Cybertruck, they ask about that. He says the engineering is done. Uh, no more design level engineering. They're just ordering the equipment. And then he talks about that crazy uh, press to build the back of the Cybertruck and be an 8,000 ton press bigger than the 6,000 ton press for the Model Y. It'll be the new biggest press in the world. I love how Tesla's continuing uh, pace of innovation to push this press technology and become a leader there. It must be working for the Model Y if they want to do it for that new um, Cybertruck. And additionally, when you think about that aluminum alloy or the stainless steel alloy that they developed with SpaceX, that's going to get pressed, I assume. it's There's a lot of material science and engineering there um, that I think is really cutting edge going on uh, for that stamping process. And he says, if we're lucky, we'll get a couple deliveries at the end of 2021 from the Cybertruck volume production in 2022. So if you're waiting for your Cybertruck, probably still going to be at least a year. Sorry. Next question about regulatory environment for FSD. I love this question actually like 
Are you skiing with regulators? What's the status of that? They're basically like, yes, this is going to be a dynamic year for regulatory partnerships. They say dynamic like three times. So that's code for we don't really know. We're definitely trying to scheme with governments, but we don't have anything concrete. And it's going to be a work in progress this year. And so I think we're really like, there's no way robo taxis are a thing this year. Next year, maybe in some jurisdictions. Um, but yeah, that's looking less and less likely as time goes forward, because I think they need to partner with some government um, who's an early adopter of the technology that says city, government, state, country, whatever, who says, yes, we can test the software. We want to be a leader and, and cater to Tesla and partner with them and really help figure out how to bring this revolutionary game-changing robo-taxi technology to market. Then there's an interesting question about the S and X and what battery cells they use. Um, I was very surprised by this because if you know, you watch my videos, I've been most hyped about the Plaid Model S because I, it's going to use the new 4680 cells. But then Elon says, actually, the new S uses a more advanced 18650 cell. We're going to use the 18650s for a couple more years. Over time, we're going to be retiring these form factors of cells and moving to a consistent one, aka the 4680. But he's basically saying like, we want all our suppliers to build 4680s eventually, but it's too complicated, too much work for them now. So they're going to keep improving those 18650s. 650s and 2170s for a few years before we're going to get Panasonic to make their own version of the 4680 and switch all to that. It's just going to take time. So I'm still really wondering um, which is the first Tesla vehicle that will be sold to a customer with those 4680 cells. I just, I'm so curious. Uh, maybe I'm just getting too hung up on that. It's not that important. But as a battery nerd, as someone who thinks Tesla's, you know, Elon's literally just pounding the table every single day. We need more batteries. We need more batteries. Well, the biggest way Tesla can expand battery production is those 4680 cells. So that, that's why I'm, okay, who cares what Drew and Elon say on the conference call about it being super vague? Can you put it in a car that's ready to be sold to customers? That is a tangible milestone that will be hugely de-risking that entire science project that's going on. So that's why I'm so curious about it. Then Elon talks about the growth rate, how he thinks it will be in excess of 50% for years to come. Like I said, um, that's pretty epic. Then there's an electric van question, which I thought Elon's basically like, yup, we're definitely doing an electric van, but we still need more batteries. That's why I haven't done the semi truck because we don't have enough, uh, enough cells. We could put it into production today, but no point until we have the 4680 in volume. So that's really interesting. And he says the semi uses 5X the amount of cells, but doesn't sell for 5X the amount of price. So it doesn't make sense for us to do it. But I was like, well, a semi truck take 5X the emissions off the road of a normal sedan, maybe. So it's interesting to see Elon prioritize money over emissions in just this micro scenario. I thought it caught me off guard, but um, next generation Tesla FSD chip. This was mentioned at Autonomy Day. Um, it looks like Elon actually has a really interesting answer here. Like, yes, the V2 chip will be three times as powerful, but we're not even using the full power of the V1 chip now. The V the V1 chip is going to get you to full autonomy. That's really just a slight improvement. The game changer, what really needs to happen for Robotax and FST is software to improve. And that's why this dojo thing and the increased video labeling is the limiting factor. And that's what's important, not this new FSD chip. Um, Baird actually comes in with a good question too, basically saying like, you'd said you'd step down from Tesla when Tesla uh, released a mass market car, which kind of has happened. Like, are you still going to be CEO of Tesla? Uh-oh, I spilled. But yeah, Elon's basically like, look, I expect to be CEO for several more years. I'm super excited about doing a bunch of projects, but nobody's going to be CEO forever of anything. Um, the work being CEO of Tesla is insane. Um, it would be nice to have a little more free time on my hands, like literally waking up every single day and just having to work constantly seven days a week from the second you get up till the second you go to bed. I feel Elon, like the dude kind of needs a break, honestly. And I, yeah, he's human at the end of the day. And so it was really interesting to get that insight. I actually loved hearing the slice of Elon's brain. Um, but then he's like, look, like we have so much work to do to make, you know, all energy generation sustainable with solar, um, wind, geothermal. It's interesting how he mentioned things beyond solar. Lots of batteries to store that energy and electric transport to consume that energy and get us around. With those three things, the future of energy and environment will be super bright. I love that. The vision of Tesla, invest in the future you believe in. And he says, so we got a long way to do on that or work on that. So he's basically going to work until the mission is done. Elon will be the CEO of Tesla. I think he's sandbagging it when he says a couple more years. That's optimistic Elon time. I think he's CEO till at least 2025. That's, I don't know. I actually, it would definitely... Um, make me a lot less bullish on Tesla if Elon reduced his involvement, because I do think he, in terms of that option, you know, upside optionality, in terms of that crazy delta for what is possible that Elon Musk can invent, there's so much to me, the innovation premium that Elon Musk deserves um, is massive. And the innovation premium that should be priced in a Tesla stock because Elon Musk runs it is massive. So if he stops innovating on behalf of Tesla, that innovation premium will decrease. He also said he's not against nuclear fission, which I thought was funny. Kind of a shout out to, to Bill Gates. Gene Munster asks about, will the semi-truck be the first uh, Tesla to achieve full autonomy? And they're like, yes, but really it's 
you know, once the FSD gets ready to achieve full autonomy, they can use it for any car. But because the Tesla semi drives mostly on highways on pre-planned routes, it might be easier. But Tesla's really said they want to have a true general purpose L5 autonomy solution. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But it's also kind of a bummer because you're like, damn, that semi is probably not going to really, really hit the road till 2022, 2023. So, you know, that's, I don't know, maybe you could read in between the lines on when they think FSD is going to be ready. But um, I do think that the platooning of trucks and autonomous electric trucks is a massive opportunity to move stuff around, not just people. Right now, Tesla's just in the people business. This is another massive trillion dollar market um, that I think they're going to just, you know, the Tesla freight network that they're going to get into, which I think is so much potential. I'm just scratching the surface. Um, so really excited to think about that um, in that lane, lane as well. Spilled again. All right, so in summary, Tesla reports record revenue, um, a huge amount of profitability, record cash flow, absolutely crushing it on all fronts. Energy business is finally breaking out, record for solar since 2018, huge all-time record for batteries, all-time record for cars delivered, uh, but almost needless to say, building three factories on three continents, all on track, FSD beta, getting ready to expand, um, cyber trucks maybe delivered by the end of the year, Tesla semi trucks maybe delivered by the end of the year, um, FSD beta rolling out to way more, I mean, there's so the list of exciting things um, that are happening here. The Plaid Model S and X is just, wow, I am so excited. And I think another big clue that I kind of want to end it on is uh, Tesla and gaming. Elon Musk loves gaming. They put this gaming computer in the Tesla. They're going to have active noise canceling in the Tesla. The focus on in-car entertainment and luxury and what you do in that car um, was so apparent with the Plaid Model S. And I think there's a lot to think through and unpack there. Um, I'm definitely going to make way more content about it. Would love to know what y'all think in the comments below. Plaid Model S, Plaid Model X. You know, what are you scheming? What did you think of these results? What, you know, what car is the 4680 going into? We still don't really know, but leave it below. Huge shout out to our Patreon supporters, producers, fun on the channel. I'm getting a little bit hoarse. Had such an epic live stream today. Thank y'all for tuning in. Love y'all. Happy Tesla earnings day. Peace.